Imagine slipping through a tiny hole in a frozen lake, entering a narrow, utterly dark passage filled with icy water, and descending over 400 feet. This is exactly what five brave Finnish divers did in February 2014. Things started well. But unfateful events one after the other changed everything in seconds. A good and loyal friend, left with an unimaginable gut-wrenching decision. Save yourself or your friend. This is the Plura Cave disaster. A disaster, difficult to digest. The Plura Cave, while beautiful, is equally deadly. If you dive into this strange pond, known as Plura, and swim underground for half a kilometer, you will emerge into a long, colorful cave. For diving enthusiasts, you can climb out of the water here to admire the grotto before returning to Plura. However, for those possessing extensive training, considerable experience, and an insatiable curiosity, a more daring option awaits. Continuing on a challenging course that rapidly descends into frigid, pitch-black waters, navigating through an underground pocket of water known as a sump. After successfully crossing this obstacle, you'll eventually ascend to the cave of Steinugleflaget. Your exit, situated approximately 90 meters above the vaulted ceiling of the cave, manifests as a crevice in the collapsed side of a hill. On 6 February 2014, two divers cut a triangular hole in the ice at Plura and, encased in waterproof dry suits and diving equipment, slipped into the water. Two hours later, after the sediment raised by the first divers had been allowed to settle, three of their friends followed behind. All five individuals shared a common destination. Steinugel Flagget. Among them were Patrick Gronkvist, Yari Huotarinen, Veza Rantanen, Yari Uzimaki, and Kai Kankanen. These divers had formed acquaintances through their explorations in the Ojamo mine, situated to the west of Helsinki. Following their customary practice, there was no designated leader among them. However, Patrick Gronkvist, one of the trio that had uncovered the passage connecting the caves the previous year, took the lead for this expedition. He was accompanied by his close friend Yari Huotarinen, who was attempting the traverse for the first time. The trip was at the extreme end of a dangerous sport. Unlike the typical amateur diver who might engage in dives lasting between 30 minutes to an hour, the trip to Steinugel Flagge would be a five-hour dive with the aid of underwater scooters. At such depths and temperatures, a tear in a dry suit on the sharp cave floor could result in death. There is also the possibility of equipment failure and hypercapnia, carbon dioxide poisoning, because carbon dioxide absorbs into the bloodstream much faster and easier at depths. Cave divers use rebreathers, which artificially absorb the carbon dioxide they exhale, but these can become overloaded if the divers start breathing quickly, and at depth it is more difficult for them to control their breathing. Hypercapnia can be deadly, but even a mild case may cause confusion and disorientation, which, in a deep cave, is liable to have serious consequences. Approximately one hour into the dive, just after navigating and descending to a point approximately 110 meters below the Plura Cave entrance, Gronkvist had a realization. Hutarinen was no longer behind. He went back and discovered that his friend had encountered difficulties in a confined area of the cave. Huotarinen was stuck in a narrow section, entangled in a cord linked to a component of his equipment and was signaling distress with his torch. Huotarinen seemed to be starting to panic, which meant he risked breathing too fast. Gronkvist gave him a cylinder of gas to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in his system, but while Huotarinen was switching mouthpieces, he started helplessly swallowing water. To Gronkvist's horror, his friend died in front of his eyes, but getting agitated would put Gronkvist himself at risk of hypercapnia. After a brief effort to free the body, he forced himself to calm down. With no alternative, he made the decision to press on towards Steinugelflaget, but at slow pace. Experienced divers well-versed in deep sea exploration understand that going directly to the surface can cause decompression sickness. Gronkvist knew he would have to spend hours making additional decompression stops before surfacing. Saving his own life, and knowing that the second group would encounter Hortarinen's body, he moved on. Visa Rantanen, leading the second team, faced a tough decision at the narrow passage. He had to choose between passing the deceased diver or making a lengthy journey back through the deepest section. Rantanen opted to move forward, a decision he considered wise, but it added about 15 minutes to his struggle to get past the lifeless diver. This choice extended his decompression time by an extra three hours eventually reuniting him with Gronkvist. However, 
Rantanen was forced to surface 80 minutes earlier than planned as he was running low on gas. Soon after, he started experiencing mild pains in his knees and elbows, indicative of decompression sickness, commonly known as the bends. Over the subsequent hours, these symptoms worsened. Later, Rantanen discovered that Jari Usimaki, the diver behind him, also faced challenges when they reached the site of the initial accident. It is speculated that Usimaki panicked after he reached the scene of the first accident. The fifth diver, Kai Kankanen, attempted but failed to save Usimaki. However, Kankanen has mentioned that his memories of exactly what happened are sketchy. What he vividly remembers is that, unlike Visa Rantanen, Konkanen decided not to push through to Steinuglaflaget. Instead, he turned around and swam the long way back to the starting point. He finally emerged from the cave in the early hours of the next day, more than 11 hours after setting off on a dive that was supposed to take five hours. To reach the surface at Plura, he had to break through a thin layer of ice. All three survivors were hospitalized due to decompression sickness. Following the devastating accident, the recovery of the fallen divers' bodies became a mission of honor for their surviving colleagues. This feeling only increased when an official recovery attempt by a team of experienced British cave divers was called off due to the high risks encountered. Despite the cave being officially closed for further exploration, a large team of experienced Finnish and Norwegian divers planned a second recovery operation in secret. The recovery team included the surviving cave divers. A total of 27 individuals arrived at Plurdalen on March 22, 2014, comprising 17 Finns and 10 Norwegians. Two teams of support divers were designated to work at shallower levels at both ends of the traverse. Meanwhile, Gronkvist, Pakarinen, and Kankinen prepared for another dive to the deepest section of the cave to retrieve the bodies. Despite recovering from a spinal injury caused by decompression sickness, Vesa took on the role of surface manager during the recovery attempt. The prior cave experience of the second team provided them with an advantage over the initial rescue team. Taking no chances this time, the first step in the five-day operation involved transporting over a ton of gear into the cave at Steinugelflaget. This gear was gradually winched up a cable to the mountain. A day was spent setting up equipment, placing 50 gas cylinders along the route, and establishing an underwater habitat on the Plura side for decompression stops. This habitat provided divers with a space to escape the cold water, remove their masks, and even eat if necessary. On March 24th, the divers commenced the recovery operation, submerging beneath the icy lid of Plura, accompanied by underwater camera operators. Passing the floating body of Jari Usimaki, they encountered Jari Hotrinen approximately 20 meters further on, exactly as Gronkvist had left him seven weeks earlier. By cutting away the equipment, they successfully released the body and navigated it through the narrow section of the cave. Gronkvist used a dive scooter to steer towards the surface, towing the body, while Pakarinen followed to assist in maneuvering it. Returning the following day, Gronkvist and Pakarinen, aided by another diver, Yanni Santala, retrieved Yari Usimaki's body. This time, the recovery from Steinuglflaget proved more challenging. The body was more buoyant and unwieldy, and Pakirinen faced a close call when a part of the cave collapsed on him. Nevertheless, both victims were lifted to Steinuglflaget, where they were placed in body bags provided by Gronkvist's fire station. The entire operation consumed 101 hours of diving time, concluding with a moment of silence in the beautiful cave.